Thank you. Sorry for the quick uh, enabling of the webcam. Um, so, who am I? <laughs> so, yes, uh, changed my name. I used to be called Martin Perez, but I got married like a month ago, and now my name is Ma uh, Martin Roca. That's very Finnish name. <laughs> Um, so I'm now also a freelancer at New Proof TMI. TMI is just basically, um, 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 well, a type of company in Finland. And I am a Valve contractor. And I used to work on Intel graphics and Nouveau. And, um, well, I guess that's about it. Oh, I used to be also a, sort of a girl, uh, um, on the board of directors. And, and I'm somewhat of a... FDO admin, very, very part-time. So why do we want to have uh, test farms, uh, bare metal test farms? Well, here we go. <laughs> so with GitLab, we got unit testing for all the drivers and being able to test uh, building them. So that's, that's wonderful. Uh, however, it's, it won't prevent all the regressions that could happen. Uh, we could emulate the hardware, especially as part of the tests, but <laughs> the models are not perfect. I mean, uh, the hardware is pretty much, I don't know, 50% of, of the code that is being executed. It's just that this code is something you can't change. Uh, hardware here also in, involves VMware. Um, so in the end, the users are not running your model. They are running on the actual hardware. So we need some level of integration testing. And since the hardware is not in the GitLab public runners, then at some point someone has to do it. So, OK, why not you? Well, one reason that could uh, motivate you to do this is that the farm could improve your productivity, uh, your personal productivity. So A, um, any kernel developer is going to have anyway one machine that is uh, the development machine and then one where you actually test your code. And there are some people who don't do this, but usually usually this is how things go. So um, one uh, advantage also of having a farm is that you could test your changes on more hardwares, uh, uh, hardware generations in one go than just the one that you would be going there, depending on your kernel, rebooting, blah, blah, blah. Uh, also, you could uh, debug issues using interactive sessions from your main PC, uh, rather than having to go to another one, you know, take the keyboard or having a KVM and switching, pain. And then one benefit also is that if you have a good farm, you could let your colleagues test their changes on, on your rare hardware, something that they don't have. And that's beneficial because that means you don't become the unofficial maintainer of the rare hardware you just got because there was one reason at some point. And that means that it spreads uh, the load of uh, keeping this hardware working. Then, so conclusion, because it's good for you and for the project <laughs> that you're working on. So in order to, to really make it better for you, there are quite a few requirements that that need to be that need to come. Um, the first one is that it needs to be more convenient than whatever the current developers are using. So it needs to be easy and fast to add the mach a new machine to the farm. Should be very easy to switch the hardware in the farm, uh, as in like switch GPUs without needing a manual reconfiguration of it. Um, you need to have full flexibility in the deployment. That means that um, the, the infrastructure that you have should not limit you in any way. You should be able to deploy whatever user space you want, whatever kernel you want, things like this. Um, if someone is using your test machine, when they are done with it, it should be as if they had not touched the machines at all then maintenance time should be limited to, let's say, an hour per week. Otherwise, it's just too much work. And then uh, at some point, you're going to have a week that you won't have time to do any maintenance. And, um, and then you won't necessarily have time to go back to it. So the farm just gets unmaintained and becomes not only useless to others, but also to you, and also to uh, potentially add noise to the, the CI results. 
another aspect is that the farm needs to be highly available. Um, so that doesn't mean that um, you need to be living in a data center. Um, you just need to be resilient to short power and network outages. And well, the, if your ISP cuts your internet connection or uh, Comcast just kills your uh, optic fiber somewhere in the, in the street, then well, that's what it is. We have redundancy for reasons. And if you look at what happened during the summer with uh, uh, OVH, where the entire data center in, <laughs> in Strasbourg just got on fire, then I guess, see, it's not different. <laughs> Um, and yeah, talking about fires, there should be many more risks for your flat house or building. That's somewhat of an important aspect. So uh, we're going to go through a couple of solutions um, that all together enable um, making a farm easy to, to use. So the first one is to use containers, not to have uh, OSs that you install on every single machine. So we've been working on the project called Boot to Container, which is an init from FS that has a declarative interface. You basically just say in the kernel command line what you want to boot and how you want to configure the machine, and, uh, and that's it. It's not complex. So that means that you don't need to install, maintain, repair the test machine's distros that just happen to get corrupted or whatever. Also, that means that every boot is fresh and you don't have leftover files from a previous run or something like this that is going to affect you because everything is running containers. But of course, if you want to use some, uh, some or share some data between the, the executions, then you can use volumes for this. And since basically it's a cache, uh, you better also back it with something like Minayo. So um, as if you want to restart the job later or something like this, then you can get back the files that you had and then continue execution. Um, also, one thing is that unlike just booting with NFS or something like this, where uh, every every boot will basically download every uh, file that you need, in when you use containers, then you have the different layers that can be cached on the test machines themselves. And that means you only download the changes or the overlay that is missing for uh, this particular run, something that if you were to change, um, uh, I don't know, a couple of files, then that would you would just download the changes, basically, or the new files, as opposed to downloading the whole disk image. That means that, well, you can basically be up and running in five seconds. That's pretty, pretty fast. <laughs> and that's the point of using an init from FS. That's uh, the smallest destroy you can make. And uh, also that. Uh, means that you can reuse the same containers across all the machines, including the ones you've made, uh, I mean, in, including CI. So you can standardize on this. So no need to make a, a root FS for your test machines. You can have just a container that you build in your, in your uh, GitLab pipeline, and then you deploy it on the test machines. It's very cool. Next. Uh, <laughs> You need to automate absolutely everything. Uh, that's the only way to to be, uh, yeah, to, to manage this. So, for instance, the deployment is done through Pixie or Network Boot. Um, then there is this concept of auto enrolling. So the reason why I put this uh, search apartment photo there on the right is because this is the name of the project uh, in our infrastructure for enrolling machines. So if you haven't seen Full Metal Jacket, then you're missing out on the joke. But it's a drill instructor, basically. So uh, what does it entail? It entails auto-discovering the hardware. Uh, when we first boot the, the machines, there is a default target on the network boot. And this one is just going to be registering the machine with the executor. Then after this, um, it's going to look at all the hardware that is in there, which GPU you have. Um, well, it can be anything. It depends on your job. In, in our case, the only thing we care about is what is the PCI ID, um, what uh, hardware generation it is, or family, or code name. And then we just create tags um, for the machine. Then we run 100 boot loops, and we check that 
all of them succeeded. And if they did, then uh, the machine is auto exposed to GitLab. And uh, on GitLab, the machine is exposed using the tags that were auto discovered. Then we have auto re enrollment. If the machine changed its tags, that means that if someone came and changed the GPU in the machine, then you don't want to run a job thinking that it's, uh, let's say, an IP10. But actually, you just replace the GPU with an IB21, and then your results are going to be all screwed. So you, you want to detect this and just say, nah, abort, abort. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, also, for configuration, we want to do as much of it uh, automatically. So the port discovered, the um, serial ports that are connected between the test machine and the gateway. We want to detect automatically which one is which. So you can tell USB. Uh, TTY, uh, TTY USB 0 is actually mapped to the machine that has the MAC address, blah, blah. And we do this using a component named salad, which could have been a, another thing that I could have put here, but didn't find a very beautiful image for this. And finally, uh, we have self-tests that are displayed on the, the screen on the ga of the gateway that just tell you, like, do you have an IP? Uh, um, it checks for heartbeats of things, or do you um, are the two network interfaces working? We're going to get into this later. So there are things like this. But what can't we automate? Well, so far the only thing we haven't automated is figuring out how, um, the mapping between the MAC address of the machine you want to boot and how to turn it on. So we're going to get into the power side right after. So this part is not automated and, and needs a little bit of uh, manual intervention. Then uh, network security, that's another aspect. So you don't want your farm to be used for, for instance, mining bitcoins, as, uh, as was just explained, uh, or I don't know, be part of a botnet, be doing anything that would be damaging. Uh, you want your machine to be serving the people you care about and no one else. So, uh, so since you probably want to make your machine publicly available so every project in GitLab could access it, then you need to be uh, careful not to allow the machine to do things that you don't want to do. So the first thing is you want to put your CI infrastructure in a separate network from your home, office and home. That's Rule number one, you don't want your farm to be able to spy on what you're doing. Then you should use a VPN to connect to the farm's gateway. Uh, of course, WireGuard nowadays is so simple to set up, and it, it's great. Just do it. Um, then you need to block any port or protocol uh, that you don't want to ever access. And this needs to be done at the router's level, so that could be in my case, it's going to be just HTTP and HTTPS. That's the only two things I accept going out because, well, we don't have other requirements. And then in the gateway, then we can be a bit more specific about which domain names we want to have. Uh, so for instance, accept anything going to free desktop. That's a good start. Um, the distro repos uh, or the repos for the distros of um, that you use in containers, so you can do you know, like uh, um, apt get uh, update, something like this. Could be also Docker Hub or Quay. Uh, then you also want to have two network adapters for your gateway. Uh, so basically, you create two networks. One that is so-called public network that you connect to the PDU. And this one, uh, so the PDU is the power delivery unit. We're going to talk about this. It's uh, to turn on machines and also uh, connected to the internet. And then you've got a private network, which is connected to your test machines. And the test machines do not have access to internet, period. Uh, so that simplifies a lot, of, uh, a lot of things. Only the runners have access. Uh, by runners, I mean the GitLab runners have access to um, the internet. And they can call the executor to uh, start a job in the test machines. OK. Then power cutting. Why do we need power cutting? Well, because it works around hardware state that just gets stuck until you uh, you do a cold boot. I mean, 
I don't know how many of you uh, experienced this, that you can reboot the machine and something is just buggy until you turn it off, you unplug it, you plug it again, and then, oh, it works. Well, so yeah, have you tried turning it on and off uh, again? So that this joke is still just true. So why waste time debugging when you can just do that every single time? And uh, once, if you use the power cutting as a signal to say just boot up, uh, then you basically have a way to turn on machines uh, as you want. And usually it's as simple as just selecting um, uh, something like boot on AC or something like this. So most motherboards allow this. But if they don't, then I have a blog post on mupif.org that is explaining how you can use a microcontroller to, to do it for you. So how do we do the power cutting? Then the normal way is to use a so-called PDU, a switchable power delivery unit. So you have a LAN uh, port where you can control, um, where you can say, I want to turn on this port. That's uh, pretty efficient. Uh, it's industrial grade. That means that there are some ratings on how often you can uh, turn on enough machines. And it's controllable using SNMP. I put it as a pro, but it's terrible. But <laughs> it's not as bad as uh, going through uh, um, a telnet session and literally saying menu one, menu two, menu three, port three, turn on. That's how a lot of PDUs can work. So you don't want that. SNMP is important. The con is that it's expensive. It can be like 500 bucks new. Uh, you can find them on for 200 or something like this on eBay, sometimes cheaper, but roughly 200 bucks. Another solution is IKEA. <laughs> so you can do power cutting by just using these smart uh, switches. Um, I mean, they are safe, but then you don't necessarily know how often you can uh, turn on enough machines. So that's a, a good question. One could assume that it's going to be, well, probably the same as a um, um, uh, relay. So I don't know, 50,000 cycles or something like this. So you definitely will need to replace these at some point. And they are relatively cheap. It's 35 euros for the gateway, 15 per socket la uh, later. So that means like every machine, would, you would just pay 15 bucks. That's pretty good. You can find them everywhere because IKEA is probably everywhere. And the protocol is documented. And there are some projects, uh, Python projects. Then um, adding new socket is annoying. Uh, I don't know if you've interacted with these. You need to bring these sort of switches there. It's, it's really a pain. Uh, it's wireless, so it can be a pro or a con. Um, but you can ask what is the state, so I guess it's fine. Like if there are some you know, interferences, you can just keep on trying. And then there's another one, which is uh, so-called Shelly plugs, which also have a power um, that can also report power. It has a REST and MQ MQTT interface. They are relatively cheap. It's Wi-Fi based, and uh, I put an example here of um, of the REST interface. That is basically what you need. And uh, finally, you need to have a UPS. So you want to make sure that if there is a surge in your electricity or micro cuts, that the battery is going to take over and you're not going to fry everything and your machine is going to stay on. Um, however, the difficulty is uh, you need to make sure that the power rating is good uh, for your farm. So you need to think about what is the maximum power consumption you're going to have in your farm and uh, you need to um, select these uh, accordingly. And you want this for all your networking equipment and test machines, because what's the point of keeping your machine online if your router is going to go down and basically lost, lose the connection anyway? So you need multiple ones. I don't think I have time to show this, but basically that's just a, a short graph of um, how things are connected. But we're going to see physically how things are looking. What the heck is going on? Mm -hmm. OK, how does it look in practice? Good. So 
this is where my farm is. Uh, so there is the gateway, a uh, couple of test machines here. It's just three for now. I have a PDU right there. I have a screen with KVM that allows me to look at the gateway and some other machines. There's ventilation, so it doesn't get hot there. So this it's extraction. It's just lucky that it was there. Um, I have some storage right now there, but it's going to be uh, at some point, hopefully full of machines. And I have a UPS and some networking equipment here. And you can see that the uh, cables here have a different color because um, orange is the public network and blue is the, um, the private one. So it's easier to, to know what is going on. Then um, in the basement, uh, even more in the basement, you can see basically that I have, um, so this switch is the one connected to my router, uh, not my router, my modem. And then it goes into my home switch or home router. And this one is uh, connected to everything, every appliance in my home. And then this one uh, basically is also connected to the CI farm. So we have two route uh, at home. We have two routers. This the one for the home and the one for um, uh, for the CI system. So with NATs, basically nothing comes in unless I explicitly enabled it. And then we've got a UPS to make sure that uh, this would not go down in case uh, in case of a micro cut. And finally, it's loading. <laughs> It's not the most important image, though. So okay, it's yeah. Um, that's just the modem with the optic fiber. So I'm lucky enough to have the fiber to the home, and I have four public IPs, uh, five public IPs. So basically, I, I literally have a different IP for the CI network or home. So that's how it looks at home. So what about the promised uh, one thousand euro? Well, let's have a quick look at the bill of material. Assuming that you have the test machines and a machine that can be used as a gateway, then here is what you'll need, a UPS or more maybe, but yeah. Then a switch for the USB so you can connect all the uh, USB serial consoles, a router, network switch, and this would be like 24 ports, so you can go for quite a, quite a bit. A big drive to store anything. And the old machine is, of course, free. Uh, we are um, thinking about making it um, possible to just have a Raspberry Pi. So that would be very cheap. Or any other single board computer would help, uh, would work. And then you've got a per machine cost that is quite minimal. Uh, for instance, here I was saying, the, let's use the Shelly plug. So that's 30 bucks. That's the most expensive one. Then uh, the uh, USB to RS-232 adapter for the serial console, I put 20 euros because sometimes you need two if you need USB to USB. And I have just RS-232 in the middle with, uh, oh, yeah, I forgot the null modem cable. But anyway, 20 euros is fine, if, especially if you get them from eBay. Then Ethernet cable, some storage. Uh, this would be just 200 um, gigs, but that's sufficient for most applications. And then you're done. So that leads to about a thousand euros. That's it. Any questions? I think I have five minutes left for the questions. We do in the uh, well, actually, no, we don't. But uh, okay, we can go with one. Uh, it will be fine. Immersion. Uh, Simon says, Sir asks, what's the status for the software which ties everything together? Is it ready to use yet? Almost. <laughs> it's um, so it is public. It's in gitlab.freestop.org slash mepub slash balbinpra. Uh, I say almost because um, we are changing the way we deploy things, and uh, there are some uh, services that we want to get rid of. And basically, let's say it's not ABI stable yet, uh, but we are hoping to get there very soon. Uh, but definitely do come in touch if you want to experiment with that, and especially if you need help with uh, selecting the hardware that you want to use um, for deployment. OK, and it looks like we don't have many questions aside from one quick addition. Why is Mupuf written on your EPS?
You have written in my UPS? On your UPS. Hmm, I don't see it. Oh, no, because this is, sorry, this is from Jitsi, anyway. Uh, because the, your name shows up exactly as it would be on this device, sorry. Ah! Ah, okay. Okay, never mind. Just confused. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so that's Very good. all that's uh, all the questions we had from IRC. So please stay around for any questions should someone have more. And then thank you and have a great day. Thank you.